I want to ask you about this thing that happened um, at a at a hearing between someone who's a very prominent kind of left activist on Twitter, Alejandra Caraballo. Sorry, I want to mispronounce her name. And um, uh, a congresswoman named Mays who basically confronted Alejandra with a tweet that had called for uh, the Supreme Court justices in the wake of Dobbs to be uh, accosted wherever they are because of the impact that the Dobbs decision could have on women. Uh, Alejandra argued that that was warranted. And this congresswoman countered back saying basically that this is the kind of violent rhetoric that has caused me to have to hire more security and has a direct impact on my life. Only a few weeks after the attempted attack on a Supreme Court justice on June 25th, one of the witnesses, Alejandra Caraballo, tweeted out the following in response to a decision on abortion overturning Roe v. Wade, and I'll quote directly from the tweet, the six justices who overturned Roe should never no peace again. It is our civic duty to accost them every time they're in public. They are pariahs. Since women don't have their rights, these justices should never have a peaceful moment in public again. I know something about being accosted. The night of January 5th, I was physically accosted on the streets of DC in Navy Yard by a constituent of mine. I fervently blamed rhetoric rhetoric on social media, rhetoric at public events, for being physically accosted. I carry a gun everywhere I go when I am in my district and I'm at home because I know personally that rhetoric has consequences. I've had my car keyed. I've had my house spray painted. I had someone trespass in my house as recently as August. I've been doxxed on social media about where I live. Um, and I've had to add to security everywhere I go, often because I can't afford it. I have to carry my own firearm wherever I go. And um, Alejandra Caraballo also recently tweeted on November 19th, not even a month ago, that the Supreme Court vested with the judicial power of the United States by our Constitution, stated they are not a legitimate court issuing decisions. And also the Supreme Court is an organ of the far right. So my last question today of Ms. Caraballo, do you stand by these comments, this kind of rhetoric on social media, and do you believe it's a threat to democracy? Thank you, Representative, for the opportunity to clarify and provide context to my tweets. <clears throat> um, and I have a question, questions. is it yes or no? Do you believe your rhetoric is a threat to democracy when you're calling to accost a branch of government, the Supreme Court, I don't believe that's a correct uh, characterization of my tweeted, statements. Though. Did you not tweet that? That you thought that the Supreme Court justices should be accosted? Did what I'm saying is that that, yes that is no? not an accurate characterization of my statements. On June 8th of this year, a man was arrested near Justice Brett Kavanaugh's home in Maryland. He told law enforcement officers he wanted to kill a Supreme Court justice. He was found. Um, uh, with uh, a knife, with a pistol, two magazines, ammunition, pepper spray, zip ties, a hammer, crowbar, and duct tape. The threats that members of Congress, the threats that branches of government face on the left and the right, as was mentioned by the chairman earlier in the committee hearing, uh, what happened to the speaker's husband is every member's worst nightmare. So it's clear to me that we have to call out the threats to our democracy emanating from wherever they come, whether it's the right or the left. It is incumbent upon every one of us to call it out on both sides of the political spectrum. And, you know, you've seen various figures kind of pick this up and run with it. I think Glenn Greenwald had the congresswoman on his show the following day. And it is, I think, an interesting moment for me because while I have substantive sympathies with the politics of Alejandra, I do think it points to the way that I think sometimes folks don't actually have a, if we're going to be honest with ourselves, it's not that we have a consistent disagreement with violent rhetoric or the use of violence. Everyone is on board with punching Nazis and all of those kinds of things, but it's very context dependent. And I wonder what you think that means for content moderation on sites like this. If we say that we don't want violent language used toward, let's say, members of the trans community or Jewish people or Black people or various other folks who have been the victims of real world assaults in an increasing manner, then what does that mean for people who are more left leaning who say things like abortion is death, you know, uh, sorry, uh, keeping uh, ending abortion rights is going to lead to death. 
we should go and fight and beat up Supreme Court justices. You know, they shouldn't be safe anywhere they go, stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, to me, like, this is why we can't depend on for-profit platforms to get content moderation right, because they will just both sides it to death. And this is why I think, like, we shouldn't make absolute statements that are content specific. Like, you know, I, I don't agree with the idea that social media platforms should ban, quote, all violent rhetoric. I think that's a too broad uh, rule because of exactly what you just described, because I think what I Hunter said is fine. And I always like something I always do and push back to people is I ask, like, you know, like run this through like everything that Fred Hampton ever said. And like, would it would Fred Hampton's tweets stay up? And if not, like probably your content moderation rule is a bad idea. But if it's um, not a, a little bit of a thing where it's I said this on a, I argued this on Rising yesterday. It seems like ultimately history tells us once we get distanced from stuff, history tells us who was on the right side of the violent remarks, which, you know, but in in 1965, it's not clear to me that people would have believed that some, you know, statement from some kind of more militant black person was actually appropriate to put on an app or put on a public newspaper or whatever versus the statement that says you should beat up black kids that are trying to integrate a school. No, exactly. Like, and it's, and that's why we shouldn't hand the power to, you know, these institutions to dictate like what is and isn't acceptable and why, from my perspective, we should avoid these kind of content specific demands. So rather than, let, mm -hmm. let, let let me elaborate. So for me, like, I actually think that there are significant steps that platforms could take to reduce things like online harassment and harm. I think that they're more around engaging in content agnostic interventions. So for example, this one account was just created and it keeps tweeting the exact same link over and over and over again at only accounts run by black women. Like that is a behavior that has nothing to do with the content. It doesn't matter mm -hmm. what's on that link, but you can look at that and be like, that's probably suspicious or problematic, right? That has to do with behavior and not content. Mm -hmm. And so broadly speaking, I think once platforms achieve a certain size, they should really focus on behavior interventions rather than content specific interventions. And again, it's like, this is the type of stuff that like no one wants to talk about because we just spend so much time being like, the other side is censoring us. No, we should censor them. And I like, agree. I about agree. And what are the tools that put power yeah. back in the hands of individuals? Um, because yeah, like, I don't think we can make blanket statements like all content like this should be banned without inevitably it's sweeping in content that we don't think should be banned. So I, I completely said, agree. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, what I'll just say too is like, it's all about trade-offs. Every content moderation strategy has trade-offs. And I think like you can believe as many of my friends, you know, in the space do that like it is worth it to have stricter content moderation rules and reduce quote unquote harmful content while acknowledging that that also will lead to censorship of important and legitimate content. I think it's like a valid ethical position to believe that like it's worth that trade-off. I disagree with that because I personally believe that the harm of censorship of marginalized people's content is greater. But like, I think reasonable people can disagree with that. Right. But, but so that what that me means, then, Evan, I just want to be clear because there's a lot, there's a lot here. What that means is Alejandra's tweet gets to stay, but also some content that is often, I think, characterized, rightly so, as harassing, violent, encour encouraging violence against historically marginalized groups also gets to stay, right? That would be my view if I were like the, the queen of Twitter and could yeah. like dictate it, right? But I'm not, and so it doesn't really matter. But like, yes, my personal perspective would be broader, more permissive rules that allow content that many of us view as repugnant and harmful, but also re allow content that many of our enemies view as harmful and repugnant versus stricter rules that, you know, lead right. to over removal of legitimate content. I think it's a thing that reasonable people can disagree on. But what bothers me is when people pretend that there are no trade-offs with right. the stricter rules. So I, I'm inclined to agree. And the reason is, I, th I think you're right. When watching this whole thing go down with Alejandra and the, uh, the, 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 the representative Mace, 
it was very frustrating because what you saw is a lot of people who felt like under the earlier Twitter, Twitter regime, they had been silenced, basically saying, ha ha, now it's your turn. There's, there's all of this like, oh, and basically an admission that it's about vengeance politics and people are just jockeying to be the one in control of the apps so that they can put the other side down. And I think a lot of the people who watched that confrontation in the from a, from a left perspective, were very uneasy. They want to kind of ideologically identify with Alejandra, but the hypocrisy is so obvious um, that they're unable to do so and basically backed away. And it feels like a win for the right. But I agree with you. I am inclined to say I would rather ratchet in the direction of being more expansive than less. But I, I don't know that, and I can't speak for her, and maybe she'd be willing to come on the podcast. I don't know that Alejandro, or at least people who are in that kind of activist community, necessarily agree, because it does seem to me that a lot of the critiques they have made of Twitter and in the Twitter of years past is that it has not been sensitive enough, not just to the kind of spamming that you describe, which I think is a problem and shouldn't be allowed because it's not substantive. And I think it's easier to identify than this content-based stuff. But it seems to me that they would, they have historically said, they don't like, they think that language that's not spam accounts, it's real people who just have views that are different from ours, that they should be censored too. That that kind of, la- that, that a broad category of language creates a harm for marginalized groups and therefore shouldn't be allowed on the app. Do you see there as a tension there and that maybe, you know, that your view, uh, your view maybe, maybe better represents a more principled left position here in this space? I mean, you know, I'm not going to say mine is more principled or less than anyone else's. But I think, again, like, I think this is where the crux of it is and like where reasonable people can disagree. I think, you know, what I hear from folks that hold that view is there is immediate harm and we're trying to reduce that harm. Um, And I believe that harm reduction is a valid strategy. I just personally try to focus on the bigger picture um, and recognizing that there are limitations to harm reduction, that we're yeah. never going to fully reduce the harm as long as we're kind of trying to exist on mm-hmm. these corporate platforms whose interests do not actually align with the interests of our movements um, and and with all of us. And so like, I'm kind of in a weird way, like while I disagree with people who um kind of focus on pushing for more content moderation as their primary strategy. In a way, I'm almost glad that they're out there doing that because I think like they are reducing harm in the short term, but I I worry about the long term of like weaponizing content moderation in this way. Mm -hmm. And that's why I believe in fighting for structural changes that Mm -hmm. lead to a world where we can have free expression and tools to protect ourselves and where we can build social movements that start to address the underlying issues. Because again, to me, you know, it's like we can chase the Nazis from one place on the internet to another, but until we like confront Nazism as an ideology and address the root causes of where it's coming from, we're, we're just chasing assholes around the internet rather than changing the structures that lead to more and more assholes in our world. Hey, YouTube. Thanks for watching. Just a reminder that this is a podcast. You can catch an extra premium episode every Monday for $5 a month at patreon.com slash badfaithpodcast. That's patreon.com slash badfaithpodcast for $5 a month, an extra episode every week. Additionally, please do consider liking this video, subscribing to this channel. It helps us out. It helps independent media beat the algorithm. We appreciate you. And as always, keep the faith.